welcome back to another episode of the Young Professionals Podcast. Uh, Sarge and myself, Luke, back again today. Sarge, who are we speaking with this time? Luke, today we're speaking to Lucas Baird. Lucas Baird is a journalist at the Australian Financial Review who specializes in covering ASX-listed corporates, most recently covering the administration of Virgin Australia. Lucas studied a Bachelor of Communications, majoring in journalism at the University of Technology in Sydney. While completing his undergraduate degree, Lucas completed work experience at the Alternative Media Group of Australia and the Australian Broadcast Network. Lucas got his first break in the industry at the RFI Group where he was covering financial services and banks before jumping across to the AFI into his current role. Lucas, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here, mate. Um, jump, jump straight into it. You're, you're a journalist at the AFR who covers, covers corporates. Uh, what what does a journalist do? And I know that's a little bit of a silly question. <laughs> and what types of things are you covering in the corporate space? Yeah, so it's um, so journalism sort of the sort of broad, broad strikes is just like sort of writing what people read on the internet in their papers every day and just sort of calling people and talking to people about what you're writing and talking to people, uh, talking to people about um, and getting in all ahead of a deadline, which can be nebulous depending on whether you're writing for online or for paper, whatnot. But um, I guess sort of in sort of what an average day looks like, um, I'm up pretty early, probably about 6.30, checking my emails from overnight, um, getting on the train, going in, sort of reading the news um, on like ABC, The Guardian, um, the AFR, Sydney Morning Herald, sort of all that sort of stuff. And then I probably like get into my desk, sit down. It's probably eight o'clock by then. And then it's another check of the emails. And then it's sort of thinking about what I'm going to be doing for the next sort of like six, seven hours throughout the day. Some days that's easier than most. Like some days you'll walk in and you'll look at your email and there'll be an ASX announcement. Um, saying Virgin Australia has gone into like administration or, or something like that. And you'll be like, cool, all right, they'll want something on that. Um, and then you'll just quickly like put it into a spreadsheet where everybody's story is collated. Um, and it's just sort of like a management tool for the editors to let them know sort of like who's working on what. Um, and then you sort of go from there. Um, and sort of corporate reporting is a little, a little bit different, I guess, in that because um, you're covering the ASX and there's all these rules around what you have to disclose to investors and stuff like that, a, lo the, a lot of the time it's not, you're not going to be proactive in the sort of the day-to-day -day sort of thing. You're going to be sort of reacting to what comes out in the morning um, and that sort of like proactiveness, sort of like, hey, I've got a story idea I might look at it, at, at this today, sort of like comes in on the slower days where the companies you aren't covering uh, aren't disclosing anything and stuff like that. So you sort of roll from about 8.30 to 12 o'clock, 2, 2 p.m., sorry, on that, and then the editors will have a, another meeting and then everything will sort of be finalised and then after that it's just sort of mad dash to the deadline at 5 p.m. Um, and then, yeah, I guess that's sort of a nub of it. You've mentioned the editor a few times. What's the food chain of a... Uh, in the journalism space in terms of the, like, what's the structure of your team? Mm -hmm. So my team, so the team that I'm in is sort of the broader, like, companies team at the, at the AFR. Um, so there'll probably be about 20 of us and we all report into the deputy company and markets editor and the um, companies and markets editor, who's obviously above the deputy. Um, they report into the editor, which is Paul Bailey at the AFR, who reports in the stat to Michael Stutchbury, who's the editor in chief. Um, and sort of because there are different sections at the papers, like there'll be a similar one for like the national reporters um, who report in the sort of like their editor who report in the Paul and so on and so on. Um, and like tech pretty much go on and on for like pretty much every section in the paper. Um, and yeah, you'll talk to them throughout the day because they want to know what you're up to and sort of how things are tracking because they're obviously fitting around things on a paper, trying to figure out what's going to lead the section, what's going to be on the front page, where's everything going to fit? Is your story going to have a graphic? Is it going to have a picture? Um, 
and they'll they'll meet probably I think three times a day. I think eight thirty is the main one, the main meeting of the editors, where they'll just sort of it's a quick one. You run through what people are looking at that that day. Uh, 2 p.m. is the bigger one where things start to take shape. You'll figure out sort of where you're placed in the paper, um, whether you're leading the section or front page or like page 26 or like whatever. And then their last meetings is about is about 5 p.m. I think, and that's when they start talking about sort of front page and and what goes on there. With that, Lucas, what I guess, how much leeway do you have as a relatively junior journalist? And and it, I don't know if there are different levels of journalist um, mm. in terms of seniority, but how much leeway do you have in terms of finding your own stories? Is it, is it much very much you come to the table with X, Y, Z, and the editors basically say yes or no, or is there a, a predetermined kind of theme that they're running with that week or, or whatever it might be? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much like can't blanch. Like if it's in your round. And do you think it's interesting? Then you're like, you'll pitch it, and then the editors will be like, yes, or maybe it needs a little bit more work before we start thinking about doing a story about it. Um, obviously, like with airlines, you might be like, hey, Qantas is selling so and so planes or leasing so and so more planes, firing how many thousand people? Um, and that's a pretty easy one to sort of get over the line with the editors and get them on board for. Um, and then like, but they're, of course, because they've got like 20 people under them, they've got to manage. They can't like sort of say like, they don't have sort of the purview to like look at everything and be like, okay, you need to cover this. You need to cover this. You need to cover this. It's sort of your responsibility to know what's on your patch and what they're going to be after what, from what's on your patch. And so like occasionally they will say, hey, somebody's sick or something like this or this has popped in the main box and this looks interesting. Um, your the free pair of hands that needs to cover it, but but it's pretty like sort of chilled out in terms of like what what direction you're getting. I think when you're in the ecosystem of the paper, you sort of know what people are after, um, especially when you've been there for like sort of a year. Um, you've got sort of like metrics um, for like what people are reading, so you know what people are reading, so you can always like go like, hey, people are reading this, we should write this story, blah 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 blah, um, and yeah, so. What does the idea generation process look like? Like say say you come in in the morning and you don't have any of those um, big announcements that you would hope that are there so you can create a story. How do you go about uh, finding your story? A lot, a lot of it's just sort of curiosity, um, sort of thinking in maybe a little bit more of an abstract way about something, um, reading sort of intensely, like you know, reading all of the documents that are disclosed to the ASX, like everything that a company that is that's in a company's annual results. So you'll like go through and like Qantas, for example, have figures for like how many sort of pre book tickets they've got on their books, which is interesting now because people are going to be cancelling all those flights because they can't travel anywhere. So you can look at that and say, hey, they've got two billion dollars worth of pre book tickets on their books. They might have to that might be something that I have to grapple with. And then you go talk to a few investors um, and sort of like firm it up is you're like, is like the central thesis of like the story strong. And a lot of that is talking to sources and stuff like that. Um, occasionally you'll just have people reach out to you. I remember one time a pilot sort of just came out of the blue and sent me some stuff about this um, new EBA. They were, neg- they were negotiating with management um, and they say, and like that that's one of the other methods um and then just sort of like chasing people and making sure you've got like a good train of like interviews going forward so that you can so that when you're talking to those people they might say something interesting a lot of it's sort of like source cultivation where you can just pick up the phone and go like hey mate like i've got nothing today what what's going on is there anything interesting going on with you guys or or anything like that so it's like it's broad, but a lot. It, it's it's broad, but um, it's a, it's a lot of sort of like legwork, if you get what I mean. Like it's a lot of just sort of like getting on the phone and calling people to get those ideas when it's slow, or reading those really long documents, um, or just yeah. You've got to you've got to be proactive and try and find. If there's nothing there, you've got to try to find something. You got to do it pretty quick. Yeah, pretty much. Like like nine times out of ten, things aren't going to like drop into your inbox. 
Yeah. And yep. so, yeah. And on that, is that something that you learned at university or during your studies? Like how, how did your degree uh, help you or, or not help you to, to learn those skills? I think sort of, I think the degree at, that I did was probably better than most because at least for my field, because at UTS there was sort of Jenna Price, who's been a journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald for a long time. She sort of, she knows what they're after and she knows everybody who works at the papers and blah, 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 blah. So like they had us very early on. So I remember one assignment, the first one or the second one they did was literally like, oh, you come from this postcode and I came from like Blacktown and the Sydney's West. And they were like, go to Mossman, which is like some leafy suburb, like, right near the water they're like you need to go find a story there and obviously because you're like dear god i don't know anybody in mossman um i have no idea what goes on in mossman um and so i went there and i just sort of like i had i like was reading the local papers and was looking at the letters to the editor over there and just saying what people were pissed off about um so that's the sort of stuff they had us doing at uni um, and sort of writing stuff on a tight deadline. They had one day where you'd one assignment where it was like a day you got, you came in at like eight o'clock and you, and the course coordinator would just be like, okay, so Wollongong's opening their new, Wollongong University's opening their new like science precinct today. Um, why don't you go to Wollongong and, and do that, come back here and we want a story by like 5 p.m.? Or something like that. So that that was really good, um, but I think sort of in the broad sense, it's very what they have you doing is very is very narrow compared to what you might end up doing. As in, you won't. I I knew nothing about sort of like of like corporate stuff like until I got out of uni, and a lot of it was learnt on the job. Um, and stuff like that. So I think there, there's a, I think there's a lot more, if you're looking at getting into journalism, I think there's probably a lot more benefit in doing something like economics or law or something like that. And then sort of like doing journalism as an extracurricular, like doing the uni newspaper or like volunteering for um, your local rag or whatever, rather than going to uni and doing, journalism because I think you'll end up in those same situations in that you are going to get thrown into the deep end doing that. On, on that, Lucas, I was going to, I was going to ask, how did you uh, get up to speed with, um, you know, the, the workings of how ASX listed companies work and, and in that mm. um, what is worth reporting on, what are people actually interested in reading about? Because, and I guess before that, do you want to actually talk about what the AFR is and, and what the, what the paper writes about as opposed to say other other newspapers that students might know like the Herald Sun or the Age or the Sydney Morning Herald or the other ones. Yeah, so the Australian Financial Review, um, it's the only nationally syndicated business focused newspaper in the country, and I guess sort of what what that means is that we are really the only paper that's reporting on corporate stuff and sort of really in-depth coverage about what's happening on the ASX, which is the securities securities exchange, sort of like where you trade your stocks and everything like that. And companies, um, I've, we're, we're definitely the most in-depth in that, like the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and the Herald Sun have business pages, but it's not like this epic, like sort of 20 page, 30 page, like spread pretty much dedicated to what's going on in corporate Australia that the Finn review is, is focused on. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's mainly sort of like national politics and business are sort of the main niches. And then we'll have a little bit of like New South Wales, Victoria poll um, and sort of every other state that's going on and sort of like some human interesty stuff where we've got like good pictures and stuff like that. But the main sort of drive is business and the intersection of sort of like business and politics and stuff like that. So with that, where did you, did you go through training when you were onboarded to say, right, these are how you read, say a 
a balance sheet or, or a ASX announcement, um, th- those kind of things that you're reporting on day to day, how did you figure out what they were and, and what they meant and, and what people are interested in hearing about? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So the AFR was very good when they were training us. I came on as a trainee um, in late 2018. Um, and so what, what that was like, we ended up having like one day a week of like training where, where we were grouped in with like trainees from the Sydney Morning Herald group and we were taught like pretty much like how to write different types of stories. But with the Finn, there was like a very sort of driven effort to make sure we understand what we know, what, what, what goes on with those sheets that are full of numbers and it's not like sort of like looking at the matrix. Um, <laughs> so they, they were good. Like I had some sort of like idea and some sort of grasp on the terminology as it regarded banks because what because of what I was doing at RFI and AB and F beforehand. Um, but it didn't really become that in depth until I started working at the Finn and they were very proactive and sort of getting us to go to UBS headquarters in Sydney um, and talking to the analysts there and sort of the analysts there, they'll sort of pretty much write to their clients saying this stock's a buy, this stock's a sell. And what's UBS just for people that aren't aware? Oh, it's a, it's a very large investment bank. Um, so it's, I think it's Swiss originally. Um, so they'll, they've just got a pile of money and they'll invest it places on behalf of their clients and stuff like that. So if you're a client of UBS, you can sort of say, Hey, um, we want to sort of sell this amount of stock in this company um, and stuff like that. And they're the people who sort it out. Um, mainly for sort of like big institutions like banks and stuff like that um, more than anything else. Um, But yeah, so the Fin was very good in that it got us into their sort of into, into their headquarters and got us talking to a lot of the analysts and the analysts sort of like had a big whiteboard just showing us how like each number feeds into that. So they were like, so revenue, it's sort of, it's turnover. It's like all these other synonyms that you've probably heard of. Um, revenue turns into profit like down the line and this is like how you work down the panel. Yeah, yeah, pretty much how you, how you get down there. Um, this is where you'll find how much cash a company has in the bank. It's on their balance sheet. Um, stuff like that. And we'll pro- we were, I think we did we did one session there really early on um, and then I think probably a lot later in the traineeship probably towards the end we had another one sort of as a refresher. And um, I'm just looking on my bookshelf because UBS gave us these little like, they, they were like kids books pretty much that were, um, that were like, this is how little Johnny like learn how to read company balance sheets <laughs> or whatever. I can't see any of that. Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, but yeah, so that was, that was quite good. And I think that's probably where I got most of my sort of grasp on it. And then like, you get, you get a grasp of it there and then it's drilled in as you sort of do the job and you sort of look at the numbers and you remember sort of, Oh, what's that's, that's where this goes. And I mean, like P and L sheets and, and sort of like, and stuff like that. Like when you, when you think about it, like they're pretty easy to read. Like it's pretty much just one number stacked on top of the other. Um, and like, it's just pretty much plus or minusing then, and then you get to the number at the bottom. So I suppose it I'd, takes your creative thinking and or lateral thinking, like you said before, to read the numbers that everyone has access to. Cause it, like mm. every, every ASX company is public by, by definition. Mm. Um, so they've all got access to that information, but it's you bringing that creative and lateral thinking to, okay, what's the story here? Like, what does this actually mean for someone yeah. to, to find out? Yeah. And I think that's sort of like the big role of journalism in this corporate space is because like anywhere you like, you don't want an uninformed poli- like public, like an, inv- an uninformed like investing public as lo- uh, the same reason you don't want like an uninformed sort of like democratic public because these people are voting with the money in their pockets over which companies are valuable and which companies, and they're sort of like picking which companies they think will have success. And when you think about it, like there's a lot of money floating around the stock market. There's a lot of people's sort of retirement incomes and stuff like that. And if people don't understand what's going on, you end up with some real horror stories where people are losing their house, losing their superannuation on these dodgy investments that no one's looked at or people have looked at too late in, or and it looked at too late and explained it too late. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like there, we, we do have like a big role in sort of looking at those numbers and sort of 
vomiting them out in some sort of like digestible form for the public. Sounds like there's a bit of, a bit of social utility there. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And no one's no one's bigger on this um, than like Johnny Shapiro at the paper. Yep. And he, he covers the big, banks, doesn't he? Yeah, at banks, yep. markets. He's a gun. He knows he knows pretty much everything about like bond markets, financial markets, anything. But he's also like a a, a mad like skeptical. Like he'll he'll look at he every company he looks at. He goes, "That's a fraud," and then like he'll spend the next six or three, six or seven weeks trying to prove it's a fraud. And if he doesn't, he's like, oh, I guess I was wrong that time. But every so often, he'll end up blowing up a company. Like there was a company a couple of years ago called Biggin that nearly entered into the ASX 200. And that would have meant all the super, big superannuation funds in Australia would have started buying into it and stuff like that. And he ended up blowing it up because it was a complete fraudulent company. Um, and I think that sort of like speaks to, to what's at stake here like people's like money are going into these could could be going into these fraudulent companies as people don't identify them or, or tell people in some sort of digestible manner what's going on in companies so that they know whether or not it's something they want to steer clear from or it's a potential risk to like put their money in there but and it's a risk they may not want to take just to go back a few steps, Lucas, you studied a Bachelor of Communications, majoring in journalism at the University of Technology in Sydney. Why did you choose to study Bachelor of Communications and was that something that was always on your radar? Um, not not really. Um, I mean, so coming out of high school, like I, I'd always wanted to do history like it was like my best subject and it was really the only major one that interests me, like kept my interest like more than any other one. But I ended up not getting the marks to get into sort of any of the courses I wanted to. Um, and luckily, so, and like communications and journalism were sort of like lower on the rung, but like, you know, I got into them and I was like, all right, well, I don't really have anything else to go off and do. I guess I'll go do this. Um, and I ended up like really, really loving it. I think sort of like, it's got like similar like core tenets to why I liked history that I'm reading a lot and learning new things all the time um and then but it's a lot more social than history i'm not digging up bones and stuff like that like i'm, I'm on the phone talking to people so i think it was like very fortuitous that i that i ended up here um because i i, I really do like it and and i like to think i'm okay at it most days so um it, it like i uh, yeah like i'd i'd fall into it there, it there was no sort of like grand plan around it on the falling into it, you seem obviously, like you just said, really happy at the fin now um, and in journalism. What are some, uh, and we touched on it in the intro, but what are some mm -hmm. examples of work experience that you've had along that journey? And I think you might've had something while you were studying as well. Do you want to touch on that and, and those steps until you've kind of got to where you are now? Yeah. So at university, they sort of drilled us, drilled into like, you need to be making sure you're getting experience on the job whether it be doing freelance or or like volunteering at your local paper so i ended up doing that um for a couple of weeks in first year and then there was and, and i mean like this is also like one of the huge problems with journalism at the moment is because nobody can afford to do it if you don't come from like a middle class upper class family because you can't afford to like dedicate all this time unpaid but um like but aside from that like it's a lot of experience building and so i volunteered at my local paper and then alternative media which is a local rag sort of like closer to the inner west of sydney um needed people um and they weren't being picky so um <laughs> they let so they let me write for them for for a little bit until un, uh, until i needed a proper job that would pay me <laughs> <laughs> um and then sort of from there late unis where I sort of concentrated on getting a lot more experience again later on. Um, just before I finished uni, I ended up getting an internship with the Sydney Morning Herald and that was down in Canberra. And I was lucky that, um, that my uncle lives down there and I was able to sort of live with him for, for four weeks while I was down there um working in parliament house so that was very good um and then pretty much straight straight after that um the guys at ab and f and rfi had i'd applied for that job before i went down for the internship but they really needed somebody before um 
before the Royal Commission. So that's how I ended up getting into that. So I guess that's sort of like the broad roadmap is sort of like little like nuts and bolts, sort of like doing experience thing and then sort of more substantial things towards the end of uni and then into the workforce. And when, when you were completing all those different work experience opportunities, what were your key focuses? I guess the, the key focus was just making sure I wasn't falling flat on my face. <laughs> like it's it's because everything can be real high paced. And um, I know like when you're in your early 20s and late teens, like the procrastination bug is there. And it's just like sort of get it, getting over that hump and like deadlines will get you over that hump because you'll be like, holy shit, I need to get this done in the next four and a half hours. Um, so a, a lot of it was just making sure it got out there. And if I had time to, to refine it a little bit more, um, and yeah, a, a lot of that is sort of like a lot of frantic calls going, going into sort of the last day before it was due, like, um, the, the paper I was at with alt media was a weekly thing. So I had a lot of time to sort of build up to that and you could like make one or two calls a day. And then it got to Monday, which was the day everything was meant to be submitted. And then you sort of had the mad rush where you call a lot more people in the day. Right. I think you've obviously had a few different internships and, and work experiences along the way. What are some strategies that you employed, uh, particularly early on when you probably didn't know many people in the industry to, to, to get people on the phone and say, yeah, sure, I can't pay you, but, you know, come in for a week or two weeks or whatever it might be. Um, what, what did you, what were you doing? Um, cold calling pretty much. Um, like just reaching out via email at the local paper was how I ended up doing that for a couple of weeks um, in a uni break one time. And, um, and then alt media was just somebody else in a tute just saying, Hey, they're, they're looking for these people. They need people to sort of write sort of like two or three stories for them a week. Um, they're like just down the road. Do you want to come check them out? Um, and stuff like that. And then just sort of like mad applications for like internships that you'll see pop up for like the ABC and the Herald and they'll pop up like every summer or something like that. And like, I didn't get any except for the um, Sydney Morning Herald one right at the end. So it was just like sort of a lesson in, in not being too disheartened by rejection, which is another good skill for journalists because you'll get a lot of people telling you to piss off on the other end of the phone. Um, when you, when you cold call them at, in the, on, on Sunday morning, which is what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on that, what are some, what, what are the key skills of a journalist and what are the things that, uh, I suppose separate? Yeah. What, what are, what are the best ways to differentiate yourself in journalism world? Um, just, I'm in terms of differentiating yourself. Um, it's just sort of having stories that other people don't have or, or that are more, more important than what other people have and just sort of like staying on top of an issue. Like if you are lucky and you get sort of like a big corporate collapse like I did, like I was like, okay, I'm going to have a story about this every day um, up until the very end. Um, and I nearly did that probably about two, two or three weeks beforehand. It sort of tapered off. And like, I think like not to toot my own horn, I think I ended up having sort of like the sort of like the most amount of coverage around it and sort of like the most sort of like broad sort of coverage of it. And I think it serviced the AFR readers and then like you'll like when you do that, like the calls will come in like when it, cause like obviously we're working at a nationally syndicated paper. So like when Virgin first collapsed, um, and like in the weeks after that, like you get a call from like the 2GB producer, the ABC radio producer, just being like, Hey, can you just do like a quick, like two minute spot and talk to the host about, about what's happened today. Um, and it's just sort of making sure you are always on top of what, what is happening that day. And that comes back to like, sort of like this intense, like, cultivation of sources and just sort of being not being like disheartened when people say no they don't have anything for you today or just not taking that as an answer and just being like hey we need we need something today like i don't i don't care if you don't think we have anything or like 
and they're getting involved in like horse trading and stuff like that. So like Bain Capital, who ended up buying Virgin, we had a photo of them, but they didn't particularly want us to use. And we called, we called them and because nothing was going on that day, we called them and said, hey, we're going to use this photo if um, you don't give us anything good. <laughs> they didn't end up giving us anything good. So we ended up using the photo, but... Like, <laughs> That's a follow through. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff like that, just sort of like constantly on the phone and just making sure that you are you know what is going on and just keeping abreast of what everybody else is writing about too. So you can be like, Oh, Robin from the Australians writing about this. She doesn't have any clue about what, what's going on over here. So I'm going to write about that and make sure we have it before anybody else gets a sniff of it and, and stuff like that. So it's a lot of sort of like reading, knowing what everybody else is writing, knowing how you can build upon that to make it different enough or to, to make it sort of like the definitive version of like what people should read that day. Mate, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I'm 24. 24, right. So, and just to your point before about, you know, if, you, if you're applying for internships and whatnot, particularly in journalism, you have to be okay with copying a lot of rejection. I think, mm. and I'd be interested if you've had some time to maybe sit back and smell the roses a little bit. Like you've had however many no's that you said to all of those applications that you put out. And then a couple of years later, you're working at probably one of the more successful um, papers in the country covering the biggest corporate collapse. And you've put, you, you, you know, you said you had most of the, most of the coverage on that. How does that feel? You know, a couple of years after getting all of those no's, um, was it vindicating as to, you know, I can, I, I can do this and I am good at this. Yeah. It, it, it feels good to know that when you, when that you can do it. Um, and like, I don't think like, I think it, I probably need to acknowledge like sort of like how lucky I am sort of in how I managed to get this far, like Jenna at UTS was very good and sort of like I, I bombed the first AFR interview um, and then she sort of like talked them in to getting me over to the second interview, which I ended up doing okay in that time and I ended up getting hired, which was good. But, <laughs> but, but um, it's like I've, I've been very lucky in sort of that I've met people along the way that have been willing to help me sort of grow and get into the positions that I want to like generate UTS, very helpful getting me into a job at the AFR. Um, and then just sort of like being lucky as well that like I was able, there was a period of time where I was able to live with my parents and I could sort of like not work and pretty much sort of like do these volunteering, do and sort of like throw all my eggs in sort of like this basket sort of very late. Um, and I was able to do that. So like it does feel it it feels good and and like it does feel good to like smell the roses. There were two weeks in between like the AFR job and my old job where I was like a bit like how good am I? Like I'm the best. <laughs> like <laughs> look at me. Um, but yeah, like it, it's it is it is like fulfilling and and like great like just knowing that I've made it this far. Um, so far without sort of any sort of like catastrophic problem landing in the way. So I guess, and as a flow on from that point, what would you tell, you know, a 21, 22 year old who's in, in uni, you know, probably living at their parents' house still and doing all that volunteer work or someone mm. that is in, you know, you're 10, you're 11 or 12 and keen to do journalism, um, worried about people saying no and worried about it being hard to, to crack. Um, well, the, 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 it's easier the earlier you start doing it. Um, and that's just sort of, I feel like that's sort of like good wisdom for everything in life. Just make sure you get on top of things early. Um, and then like, cause like you, you'll build those skills like a lot earlier. you like, you'll get used to people saying no on the phone a lot earlier. You will be comfortable with rejection like a lot earlier, you'll be more comfortable with like people screaming at you over the phone because they didn't like what you wrote or like the terse convo or like picking up the phone and being like, all right, I'm, I'm ready to have like a terse conversation with somebody who has like sold me down the river on this like one thing. Like the, the earlier you start doing those things, the earlier you start writing, the earlier you start, you start calling people and looking in the issues that interest you, the quicker you'll it'll be easier like when you get to sort of like 21, 22, 23, like it'll, it'll, it'll always get easier like to do that as like 
as long as you sort of like start early, if you get what I mean, like. Yeah, just put, put of, the work in. Uh, put, put the work uh, in now. and then sort of yeah, put the work in now and start yeah. building that now because it's a lot easier to do it now than it would be if you were sort of like 34, 35 and you're looking to change careers or, or, or anything like that. Well, de- it definitely accelerates the learning curve because the sooner you start, the sooner you learn, the sooner you learn, the, yeah, exactly. the sooner you can implement that learning. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's sort of like what I – thank you for putting that in like a point that was digestible <laughs> instead of like my incoherent rambling. That's all right, mate. Um, one, one final question. What advice would you have for – or what advice would you give yourself that you might not have listened to when you were younger? Oh, that's difficult. Uh, <laughs> I think the do things early bit is yep. definitely I'm a chronic procrastinator and it's advice I don't even listen to sometimes. Like in my, in my job, like you'll just be like days where it gets to like, like 10, 11, 12, like you're like, oh yeah, I've got, I've got plenty of time to do this. And then all of a sudden it's 2 p.m. and yep. you've got two hours to put together like 700 words. <laughs> I think yep. that's like the key thing that I, I should have grasped earlier and I'm still sort of like coming to grips with a little, a little bit. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. And there's a, there's a good, um, I can't remember the title of it, but there's a good YouTube video of someone giving a Ted talk about procrastination and it's like the, the ugly monster that festers away in people. And then, and then it yeah. kind of gets to the end of the end of the day and you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> I need to. Yeah, need like to the monster the gets through. bigger every hour and it gets harder to do it every <laughs> yeah. day, every, every like hour you leave it longer. Mm. Like, and then it becomes, and then like, it's like a double edged sword because that gets bigger and you're like, Oh shit, I don't really want to do this anymore because it's going to be really hard to get it done now. So mm. Yeah. No, no, I think that's good advice to get on stuff as early as you can and you, you can reap the rewards of that, of that kind of um, leg work earlier and then, and, mm. and then apply that in, in your Yeah, in like your it'll take people like, it'll take people like broadly the same amount of time to get to the same point. Mm. Like the way you get a jump on people is by starting a lot earlier, starting that process a lot earlier. Oh, mate, I think that's a great place to leave it. And I, I've learned a lot about what being a journalist is about um, with this chat. And I hope a lot of people other do, a lot of other people do too, rather. Um, so I really appreciate the time. Um, and yeah, th- thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's great to chat.